Now, however, it is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Hill Walker as our morning plenary presenter. Uh, Hill is a friend, a colleague, and he is somebody who, quite frankly, has been a honest-to-goodness clear mentor, both for George and myself. He's somebody who has made a wide array of contributions to the field, and different people in the audience know Hill Walker for individual events, but part of what I want you to get is a sense of just the breadth of his contributions. Hill's a professor, uh, an emeritus professor in special education at the University of Oregon. He is the founder and co-director of the Institute on Violence and Destructive Behavior. He has a list of distinguished awards that is as long as most people's vitas. Um, and the, the one I want you to really pay attention to is the one at the bottom. There's the, he has been awarded the University of Oregon Presidential Medal. The thing that is so important about that is if you work at universities, you know the Presidential Medal is very seldom awarded to sitting faculty. Hill Walker is the first faculty member at the University of Oregon to be awarded the Presidential Medal. It is a symbol of the breadth, depth, and quality of his contribution that the university would make that type of, of recognition. Now, Hill's contributions are many and varied. He has worked in the area of assessment of behavior. Those of you who have used the SSBD, a screening tool for identifying kids who need more significant support, uh, anyone who's been engaged and involved in classroom management systems has taken time to read and learn some of Hill Walker's work. The class program was one that he developed early. Acting out and anti acting out with students and antisocial behavior. If you are aware, if you work with young children, the First Step to Success program was a program that Hill built. He, he worked from little kids and school age kids and really got more and more interested in those kids with real extreme and violent behavior. He founded the Institute on Violence and Destructive Behavior at the University of Oregon, and he actually started working more closely with people in juvenile justice. Now I gotta say, one of the things that I noted when he started getting more involved with juvenile justice and criminal behavior is, I want you to look at that picture up there. See that picture? That was the picture that was on the website for a long time. As he moved into the more criminal and juvenile justice stuff, the picture shifted to this. <laughs> All right? And it is a testament to Hill's ability to really span and, and deliver in many ways, you know, the vision that fits the context. There are, there are basically three things that I, that I really want you to take away. One of the things that I really want you to appreciate is Hill Walker is one of the people who has defined the process of taking good science and building practical applications. He is a scholar who has made contributions that parents, families, children, teachers, and administrators recognize as valued, usable, and practical. The other thing that we owe him deeply for is his ability to link disciplines. Hill Walker is someone who can speak with early intervention, he can speak with administrators, he can speak with juvenile justice, he can speak with community health, and he has, he has an amazing quality of being able to listen carefully to the voices and the messages that come from different disciplines take from those voices the key features and make it fit together. For us, an example of that is Hill Walker is the person who brought us the triangle. You're supposed to go, oh, that's it, okay, good. Seriously, <clears throat> in 1994, 95, 96, when Hill was first working with community health people in the area of, of uh, discipline and school-wide systems, he was the one who first started talking about the three-tiered contingency as being a system, a structure, for really integrating the multiple levels of support that kids need. The ways of bringing together not just all of these 
different siloed strategies, but be creating a uniform system that would be both more efficient, more effective, and more helpful to kids. So with that, please join me in welcoming Dr. Hill Walker. Rob, thank you for that gracious, wonderful introduction. Uh, no one can do an introduction quite like Rob Horner. <laughs> uh, I'm delighted to be here, and uh, I appreciate very much the opportunity to share some remarks with you this morning. I'd like to thank uh, Rob and George and Lucille for inviting me. Um, it's a great pleasure and a great honor to be uh, asked to, to share these remarks. Um, I wanted to point out uh, that I'm a duck, an Oregon duck. That's our mascot. Um, some, uh, m most universities uh, think carefully about selecting a mascot. And in terms of sports, they tend to choose mascots that have an intimidating factor associated with them like the Washington State Cougars, the Washington Huskies, the California Bears, the Florida Gators, <laughs> the, the Arkansas Razorbacks, I think. Um, so I've never found anyone who's afraid of a duck. Uh, but anyway, <laughs> um, the, um, let's see, get organized here. Thank you. As Rob mentioned, I'm the uh, co-director, along with Jeff Sprague, of the uh, Institute on Violence and Destructive Behavior at the University of Oregon. Um, this institute was initially founded in 1993. These are some of the areas in which we work. Um, also, we offer tutorials. If you want to become violent, we can show you how to do it. Um, <laughs> Jeff Sprague is the major uh, partner or player in the IVDB, and I'm the minor player, so on. So, so I want to get that <laughs> established. Um, the theme of uh, this keynote um, is as follows. I want to uh, recognize PBIS as an exemplar of evidence-based practices of the highest quality and order that operate in schools. And I want to talk about past, present, and future briefly. I want to describe the history and origins of PBIS as I understand them, describe some current applications and some cr critical features of PBIS, I think, that uh, help to make it work and talk about a few challenges and opportunities in, in, in the future re, re, relating to this amazing uh, intervention. I was in a session yesterday, and the, the speaker referred to herself as a PBIS evangelist, and I would say that I am also. So, <laughs> okay. Um, as Rob said, I've worked with uh, younger, uh, antisocial, acting out, and aggressive uh, children for my entire career. I won't uh, go into how long I've been doing this, but it's been many, many years. And um, one of the things that developmental research, longitudinal, long-term studies of this population have shown is that uh, they are exposed to a host of risk factors in their uh, lives prior to coming to school. So the risk factors that impact them at family, neighborhood, school, and societal levels. So a uh, risk factor that most uh, antisocial children, for example, are exposed to is dysfunctional and sometimes neglectful parenting. A uh, protective factor that offsets and buffers um, those kinds of risks would be school success. Having a good social support network, being socially skilled in such a way that you can build social capital 
You can draw people to you. And uh, uh, the, what you want is an imbalance between protective factors and risks. That is, you want a small number of risks or none in your life, and you want a large number of protective factors. Well, the population that I've worked with and I'm interested in has the exact opposite. They have very large numbers of risk exposures and almost no protective factors to buffer and offset them. So um, these children are, are born into a family situation very often that's uh, risk laden. And they spend five years or so in that environment dealing with all of those risks and pressures and they, they enter the schoolhouse door acting like Attila the Hun, Ivan the Terrible, and Eric the Red. They are not ready for school. They're not socialized to the norms of schooling. They don't know how to cooperate, don't know how to take directions from adults. They have a very coercive, interactive style. And they tend not to want to take responsibility for their own behavior and to avoid at all costs consequences for their actions. Um, I've been fascinated to see how they see themselves in the world in relation to others. And this was dramatically illustrated for me a few years ago uh, through an experience that a friend of ours had in Longmont, Colorado. Um, this woman's name was Billy Webb, and she uh, is married to Dwayne Webb, the founder of the Sopris West Publishing Company. And Billy uh, was a school psych, a school psychologist in Longmont for years and years. And she uh, served three small elementary schools. And this one elementary school had a little girl in the third grade named Sarah. And Sarah was a regular customer of Billy's. Every time she came to visit the school, there would be something Sarah had done. And Sarah was uh, bright, socially skilled, uh, devious, uh, loved to get other students in trouble, uh, <clears throat> and, and, and was a, a difficult student for teachers to manage. So one day, Billy shows up at uh, Sarah's school, and the principal and the counselor are waiting for her to tell her the latest things Sarah had done on the playground and to call her in and please take care of it. So she calls in Sarah. And um, they're kind of making small talk, and Billy says, well, Sarah, I understand you've been having problems on the playground again. And Sarah just looked at her. And she, trying to engage her, she said, well, Sarah, what do you think people are going to say about that, what you've done? Sarah thought a minute, looked at Billy, and said, well, Billy, some people might say you're not doing your job. <laughs> so, <laughs> this population can be very challenging. So, uh, children bring this coercive, aggressive, interactive uh, behavior pattern to school. And by the way, aggressive behavior is one of the highest rated forms of teacher-nominated student behavior in terms of being unacceptable. It's one of the top rates. Stealing, lying, cheating, and aggression are the top four. So um, <laughs> often with these kids, you get the whole package. They steal, lie, cheat, and they're aggressive. And most of their aggression is directed toward peers, but in increasing numbers of cases, we see it directed toward adults as well. So uh, these children hit the school setting unprepared for schooling. They put enormous pressure on the teaching and management skills of classroom teachers. We don't train teachers in our teacher training program to deal with this population well. And as the work of uh, Jeff Colvin clearly indicates, uh, teachers fail miserably. They allow themselves to get engaged in escalated interactions with these students. And uh, in that situation, you have an amateur and a professional. And the professional is not the teacher. Um, so <clears throat> this history of risk uh, factor exposure 
lack of protections. And then the first two or three years of schooling, these children establish themselves as problems as difficult as uh, requiring specialized accommodations, and they're among the least liked students in school. So this whole uh, set of conditions leads to a host of maladaptive behavioral m manifestations, I call them, defiance of adults, they're not ready for school, coercive styles of interaction, very aggressive and harassing toward peers, and a lack of problem-solving skills. Now, I've been uh, interested, too, in the extent to which these children harass and aggress toward and, and bully others. I grew up in the South where um, teasing and harassment is almost a part of the lifestyle. Even adults in the South will tease children in public, uh, so in some parts of the South. I'll say. So we were curious about whether teachers knew who these students were. If we said, identify for us students that tease other students a lot and do it in a, in a mean-spirited way. Well, we got a clear answer to our question when we set up a focus group of six students in the fourth grade, each nominated by their respective fourth grade teacher. And uh, we had uh, popcorn and Kool-Aid and everything, and we told these parents of the students we would pay them for participating in a focus group. So um, we're s sitting there, and there are three adults in the room, including yours truly, and these six students walked in. These are students that had been nominated by their teachers as high-rate teasers and harassers of their peers. And the best way I can describe the ambience when they came in the room was it would be like in the Old West, the Cole Younger gang walks into a saloon. Uh, the piano player stops playing, the bartender stops serving, the poker game stops. Everyone wants to know what the Cole Younger gang boys are gonna do. So um, we had them sit down and uh, the coordinator of the focus group was a woman named Kate Marquez, and she says, my name is Kate Marquez, and we're here to talk about teasing. And immediately this boy raised his hand. He couldn't wait to tell us how he tortured his peers. And she said, well, let's, um, <laughs> let's go around the room and say our name and what school we uh, go to. So this little boy said, I'm uh, Jason from uh, Edison School. So the boy said, I'm Kevin from uh, Ellis Parker, and I'm sitting there, so I said, I'm Hill Walker from the University of Oregon. They all looked at me, and one of them says, Hill Walker? What kind of stupid name is that? <laughs> <laughs> so I was speechless for one of the few times in my life. <laughs> so anyway, they went on to tell us how they tortured their peers, and it was amazing. The stories, they had no empathy. Sympathy was <laughs> a foreign concept. Um, they, the only uh, time they admitted they would not tease someone was if they were in a wheelchair or had an obvious disability. And uh, I wasn't even sure about that. So uh, these uh, students, you know, progress along this path through the grades. They have reputations that precede them. They're generally rejected by teachers and they also get rejected by most of their peers, except other peers like them. So around this point, grade five or six or so, um, they become eligible for membership in a deviant peer group. Now say I'm the antisocial, uh, and they're generally boys, uh, this is just one of many indicators of how females are the superior member of the human species. Uh, I'm not really kidding. <laughs> so, um, um, so a delegation might come to me of my peers and they would say, a number of us have been observing your behavior for some time and frankly, we like what we see. And we'd like to know if you'd care to join our little deviant peer group. 
So I might say, well, <laughs> why should I care about your deviant peer group? He said, oh, we have a great time. We torture animals. We uh, bully peers. We uh, skip school. We, you know, shoplift. We do all kinds of things. So if I pass whatever rituals are necessary to gain admission to that peer group, um, I have my first felony arrest within three years. Now, it's important to keep in mind there's one arrest for every 10 arrestable offenses committed. So I get socialized to a, a criminal pattern of behavior, high levels of deviance reflected in delinquent behavior. Also, we find that um, these students uh, use the best instructional techniques of cueing, prompting, modeling, debriefing, and reinforcement to teach new patterns of deviance. Uh, so it's quite a little support group. And one of the things that is characteristic of these students is they have a very high number of disciplinary referrals to the front office. Well, if, if I remain on this pathway, then my history, my pattern, uh, predicts a future that is very destructive, very costly, um, and very, very difficult to turn around. So what are the takeaway lessons here? One, you want to find these children as early as you possibly can in their preschool, kindergarten, or primary grade uh, experiences. You want to do everything you can to get them off this path and onto a path leading to school success. School success is almost like a vaccine and it protects you from a host of long-term negative outcomes like teenage pregnancy, drug use, delinquency, violent behavior, and so on. Um, the, the sooner you can get them off this path, the, the better. Uh, people say if you haven't accomplished that by the end of grade three, you may not be able to. There's some truth to that, but you never ever give up on a student. Never ever. Uh, because there's always a possibility that they can turn their lives around with the right kinds of supports. And that's one of the many reasons that I'm such a fan of positive behavior, intervention, support approaches. It provides a vehicle and a means for these students to be successful in school, and that in turn buffers a host of, of uh, risk factors. So, so um, why, ha why haven't we been able to implement um, what we know. We have known for 20 years a great deal about how to divert these children from this path, how to teach them patterns of adaptive appropriate behavior that will contribute to school success and success in life. We know that you have to impact and involve the three social agents that are most important in a child's life, those are parents, teachers, and peers. When you design comprehensive interventions for this population, you must think in terms of those three social agents as not only supporters, but active collaborators in the intervention. And as Rob and George have said so often, you need to stay with it uh, within and across school years. So we have had a major problem in our field, such as exists in most fields, and that is the time lag between the availability of an innovation and its widespread adoption and effective use. Typically in uh, mental health, there's about a 20 year lag between the discovery of effective interventions and their widespread use and scaling up so that they are available on a routine basis. Uh, in K-12 education, historically, I think the time lag has been at least that long. Uh, I want to just point out something to you about how difficult it is to get an innovation introduced, scaled up, 
and routinely used. A British surgeon um, in the uh, uh, Navy, the British Navy, discovered the cure for scurvy in like 1750. And the cure for scurvy is a proper amount of citrus in your diet, a very simple intervention and solution. The problem with scurvy was so severe that British merchant and naval ships would leave port and have to return a month or two later because half their crew was either dead or totally incapacitated with scurvy. Scurvy was a scourge. So um, guess how long it took for that simple dietary cure to be fully implemented in the British naval and merchant fleets. It took 100 years, 100 years. So when I look at the way um, positive behavior intervention supports has been introduced and scaled up and over the past 10 to 12 years has been adopted by 13,000 schools and counting. I think it's maybe the most remarkable example of scaling up we have ever seen in the field of education. Truly, truly remarkable. And it refers, it's a result of the careful thought, creativity, and genius of um, Rob and George and Lucille and others who put this uh, model together and refined it and adapted it to the normal demands, routines, and operations of schooling. That is just a uh, stroke of genius. Typically, we find that the gap between research and practice um, results from people thinking it costs too much, they have difficulty accessing it, uh, they have philosophical objections to it, we have a gene we're all born with that I call resistance to change. And the innovation takes too much time and effort. What are some factors that are driving interest in evidence-based practices? And to their credit, the developers of PBIS have carefully selected and promoted evidence-based practices that are really evidence-based, that they show e e efficacy and sometimes effectiveness as well. Well, I think some factors that have caused a sea change in how receptive our schools and society has become to the adoption and, and implementation of these practices is national legislation, of course, Court mandates. It's unfortunate to have your field driven by court mandates, but sometimes it's necessary. It took a Supreme Court decision to get schools to uh, properly acknowledge and deal with bullying and peer harassment. A Supreme Court decision, think about that. Threats to school security in the mid 90s uh, were a huge factor. Um, people wanted to see programs that made the school safe and secure, justifiably so. Uh, the public demand for return on investments in its um, research at a federal level really escalated about 15 years ago. The National Institutes of Mental Health began to get messages we have spent billions and billions and billions in funding you. Where are the results? So the National Institute of Mental Health in particular had a clear focus and has maintained that focus starting about the late 90s on showing how your research is making a difference in the lives of children, youth, and families. There has been a growing interest in preven prevention accelerated by a realization that specialized accommodations of students, such as special education, is not a viable long-term strategy. It's a low-impact strategy. Special education has been captured by attorneys and the legal profession. My apologies to you who uh, are attorneys, 
But the fact is, special education is so riddled by legal constraints and mandates that it cannot be an effective service in the way that it needs to be. <coughs> and finally, development of quality standards by professional organizations such as the American Psychological Association. So where are schools regarding these new evidence-based practices? Until relatively, what, 10 or 12 years ago, you would have to say that schools have been slow to adopt proven and, and promising evidence-based practices. The vast majority of K-12 students still today have not accessed effective interventions, but PBIS is far and away the most powerful and accessible intervention available to schools to address the needs of all students. So there's been a slowly building set of pressures on school administrators and educators to adopt and implement best and preferred practices that are evidence-based. So there have been some uh, seminal innovations in better serving this population that have ramped up substantially in the past decade. The three-tiered public health prevention model applied to school context is a clear example of that. Um, I wanna tell you a quick true story about how this came to be. In uh, 1995, I was sitting in my office at the University of Oregon. I got a phone call from the Eugene Director of Pupil Services. He said, I'd like to meet with you. He said, I wanna talk about all the services in the district, how fragmented they are, how ineffective they are, how costly they are, talk about duplication. Is there any way we can solve this? Is there a better way? So I was happy to meet with him. And we had done years of research in his district and the district had been very supportive of our efforts. So we had coffee and we chatted. And I said, how about I do some work, research, and write you a memo laying out what I think would be needed. And I wrote him a um, five-page, single-spaced memo that essentially laid out the three-tiered model as applied to schools. In other words, taking the U.S. Public Health Service model of primary, secondary, and tertiary prevention that matches up with uh, universal selected and e indicated interventions of increasing intensity and showed how he could use that model to uh, better allocate and coordinate these fragmented interventions and uh, better use the resources he had. And uh, I sent him the memo <laughs> and I never heard another word from him ever. Not a word. And I was thinking, maybe it got lost in the mail. So I called his secretary, who I knew, and I said, do you know if he got this? Oh, yeah, he was talking about it. But that's all he ever did. And so um, I had a friend and colleague named Mike Epstein at the University of Nebraska-Lincoln, and I called him up, and I was telling him about this experience. And Mike said, send me the memo. So I sent it to him. And... Uh, he called me back and he said, you know, this could make the basis for, for an interesting article. Why don't you uh, uh, d develop this into an article? So being uh, semi-smart, I contacted Rob Horner and George Sugai and Jeff Sprague and a couple of other colleagues and said, we have a good opportunity here to write an article that could influence how schools uh, think about, about interventions and so on. So we wrote this article, it was published in JEBD, the Journal of Emotional Behavior Disorders that Mike was the editor of in 1996. And that's how the three-tiered model got into the literature in the field of education. So now you've had your history lesson, you can pass a test on that question. Uh, <laughs> thank you. 
Success in this business, believe me, is all about who you choose to affiliate with, and I'm really good at affiliating with skilled people. Um, the advent of the use of response to intervention approaches for screening, identification, and treatment has been a huge innovation. Uh, there's been a strong interest by psychologists in conducting school-based research on conduct disorders, particularly using whole school approaches like PBIS. And there's been a strong priority of adapting promising practices that have been developed in atypical school settings or context for routine use in school settings. Kimberly Hogwood has developed a series of wonderful articles, and I recommend them to you, about all the wonderful interventions that sit on shelves not being used because the developers have not taken into account what schools need, what they value, how they operate, what the routine practices in, in schools consist of. And that's a real shame. But part of the uh, genius of, okay, this always happens to me. We have an IT person right here. I'm, a, I'm an AV Jonah, do you know that term? A Jonah was a term for people in the Old West that were bad luck. Uh, when they visited you, the cow stopped giving milk, the well <laughs> dried up, the barn burned down. I'm an AV Jonah. I don't know what I did. I must have locked it up. It doesn't like me. <laughs> Is that it? Oh, okay. Thank you. I'm glad you were here. <laughs> right. So um, I have spent my career trying to promote <coughs> and sell interventions to schools that I think are sufficient to address the problem. And what I've found out over and over and over is that the people I'm talking to are expecting yogurt and ice cream, and I'm selling liver and onions. And we don't even see liver and onions on menus in restaurants anymore because uh, <laughs> no one buys it. Uh, but these two little boys here represent uh, school gatekeepers. <laughs> and I'm driving that truck. I'm not doing, I don't know what I'm doing. I'm not holding my mouth right. What? Hmm? Oh, okay. All right. I'll, I'll, I'll just use the keyboard. Uh, is it right there? No. This? <laughs> Took it a while. Yeah, you and Dave, hmm? I'm doing this. You went? This is, uh, while she's working on this, this is the uh, other reaction that I've typically gotten. Uh, it's a cowboy whose task it is to herd cats. And uh, you can see all the success that he's having herding cats. Okay. Um, this describes a lot of my history. The single greatest tragedy of science is a cold-blooded slaying of a beautiful theory by an ugly fact. Um, how many of you know what a randomized controlled trial is? You know that? Okay. Randomized controlled trial is you, ran, you identify a population with uh, whom you want to see if an intervention works or applies to. So you randomly assign half of that population to treatment and the other half to a control or usual care condition. And then you collect baseline measures and during measures and post measures and follow up measures and you make a decision. Did the intervention work or not? And in order for a judgment to be rendered that it worked, you have to uh, show reliably that the 
students or individuals who got the intervention are uh, superior to the ones that didn't in terms of the outcomes that you're using. So, okay, what are we doing? Hmm? Uh, back front. Okay, that's... That reverse and okay. sets forward. Okay, good, thank you. Um, <laughs> I, I have a gr gr graphic artist named Arden Munkers, and Arden is a person who thinks in pictures and I think in words. So I'll go to Arden with some words and he will convert them to pictures. So I wanted to illustrate the cruelty of uh, randomized controlled trials. So this is a Viking warrior representing a randomized controlled trial. And he's wielding a sword here that says ugly fact. And he's slaying a beautiful theory Commonly held assumptions and what is that? Cherished beliefs. So <laughs> um, maybe my sense of humor doesn't match up with yours. But <laughs> <coughs> I think it's funny. Uh, <laughs> okay. <laughs> what are the origins of P PBIS? Um, it grows out of the knowledge base uh, and the behavioral technology of applied behavior analysis. Uh, applied behavior analysis works. The jury is in. It applies the US Public Health Service model of prevention to schools in a very productive way. It adopts the policy logic of mental health and ju juvenile justice. This is... Uh, one of the more amazing representations of the three-tiered model I've seen. It's absolutely wonderful. It shows the parallelism between academic and behavioral systems. And at a glance, think about the amount of information that an individual can glean from this figure. And what's great about it is it's visual. People can carry around this image in their head as they think about ways to improve schools. So it has um, many uses and value. There were some exciting things happening in uh, the area around Eugene and the schools at the university in the mid 90s. And I remember seeing um, some graphs that Rob and uh, George had produced about the number of disciplinary referrals in the schools they were working in where there were way more disciplinary referrals than there were students in the school. And I couldn't believe it, but I did believe it because I know them. Um, and like, um, this is Fern Ridge Middle School. And in 1993-94, it was estimated there were 7,000 disciplinary referrals by teachers to the front of Can you imagine what that school was like? So here's what happened over the next uh, four to five years. Just a remarkable transformation of the school. And one of the great things about that is you have a metric that lets you know how your school is doing as a um, unified whole. Um, so the three-tiered heuristic provides this beautiful conceptual framework and a scaffold for implementing a whole school approach to behavior management. It uses archival school records and disciplinary referrals to allow uh, individuals to take a look at how the school is doing. The school-wide information system that Rob and company have developed is a seminal contribution that lets you record these disciplinary referrals in a systematic way and to code them in terms of severity. PBIS applies the concept of continuous positive support to student behavior. That is a really important concept because for years, um, school administrators and teachers would tell me, I want you to implement this program. It has to go a certain amount of time, not too long and I want to see change in the child's behavior and I want the program to end and the change to continue. A tall order, I've never been able to fill that order. 
Uh, one of the great things about PBIS is that you provide continuous positive support to students that you're targeting, and it never goes away. Uh, and of course, as you all know, P PBIS addresses all school settings. What are some of the factors that make it work? And there are a number of them. Uh, it's probably most important, consistent with the priorities, routines, values, and operations of the school context. It's a great example of a, uh, a good practice environment fit. And it considers the school as a dynamic system within a district and community that's always changing. It integrates and coordinates key components that are evidence-based and acceptable to educators. That's a tall order, getting both of those right. It has a strong focus on the implementation fidelity that's measured regularly and prompts corrective actions. One of the greatest challenges facing us in schools is to implement interventions and procedures with good integrity. And I can't tell you how important that is with PBIS of all the things that you do and think about PBIS and the actions you take, make sure that implementing and maintaining fidelity is at the top of your list. And it allows flexible adaptation and fine tuning of PBIS, very important. Here's what I think uh, are the factors that influence whether educators will give you that um, herding cats response or the <laughs> ice cream truck response versus acceptance. And it, your, your intervention needs to address these values. PBIS addresses each and every one of those, and that's part of the reason that it's so broadly accepted. You uh, probably know, many of you, the distinction between the efficacy of an intervention and its effectiveness. Uh, I urge you to read the article that, was it Rob or George referred to yesterday that they've written with Cindy Anderson on the evidence base for P PBIS. It's important that you know that. And um, I believe that PBIS is an effective practice as well as an efficacious practice. And effectiveness means it operates under normal conditions of usage, and it does so effectively. This is a graphic from a, a book by R Ronnie Dietrich of the w w Wing Institute in Berkeley. And it talks about efficacy versus effectiveness. And implementation is a tool that allows you to make a practice e efficacious. Careful monitoring of the intervention and its outcomes will determine under what conditions and when it works and whether it's actually effective. So what you're looking for is an intervention that's effective. So why has PBIS been so widely accepted? It allows schools to respond to the needs of all students. It's the first intervention I've ever seen come down the pike that can legitimately claim that. Promotes the concept of continuing positive behavioral support, extremely important. It carefully defines the roles of each PBIS participant. And this whole idea of continuing positive behavioral support I think we'll ultimately find that PBIS reduces school dropout. It increases the holding power of the school. When you, when you interview school dropouts, what they always say is, I had the sense that nobody cared about me in the school. And PBIS turns that around. It addresses that. And school has to be a place where students feel cared about. It uh, provides well-developed training materials. Uh, I would say they're exemplary. It uses checklists and guidelines to support user-friendly implementation. I'm gonna recommend a book to you, uh, and it's by Atul Gawande, who is a Harvard surgeon, and it's called The Checklist Manifesto, 
How to Get Things Right. And it's published by Metropolitan Books in 2009. Um, it costs about $15, I think, per copy. This book has had a profound impact on hospitals, and it's devoted to making hospitals safer and creating safe surgeries. There are 100,000 preventable deaths in this country every year. 100,000 deaths that could be prevented. And you know what they're due to? Medical errors and incompetence. So he took a look at the role of checklists. He said, we put people in space, put men on the moon. We uh, build skyscrapers that are how many stories? 50, 100 stories high. Uh, we have pilots, highly trained pilots, who will fly a 40-ton aircraft down a runway, get it to take off. Now, we increasingly use computers you know, to compensate for our human tendency to make errors. But you have to identify the right steps to produce the outcome you want, and you have to make sure that they are monitored and checked uh, when they need to be to prevent catastrophic outcomes. Uh, when you build a 100-story skyscraper, you cannot afford to make mistakes that could possibly result in a catastrophic outcome. The same with flying a huge jet or putting people in space. And we've seen some terrible examples of what happens in space when uh, checklist guidelines are not properly followed. So um, I can't think of a better strategy for ensuring fidelity of implementation than the careful use of checklists where you review the steps and you make sure that you have addressed each one. There are two types of checklist. One is called a read and do. It's like a recipe to make a cake. You read it, you do it. When you're fluent with a process of like preparing for surgery and so on, uh, it's, uh, the model is, confirm, is, is do and confirm. So you do it and then you confirm that you did it at, at regular points. One of the reasons I think that um, PBIS works so well is that it has used checklists like this from day one. So complete your checklist, review them regularly. It's the single best way to pre prevent errors and mistakes, okay? Um, does PBIS have a role to play in the current press for school reform? Absolutely unqualified, yes. It represents a model of the effective, accountable school that is the focus currently of school improvement efforts. We're blaming teachers, we're blaming administrators. We are ignoring the role that our society plays in producing students who come to school not ready to learn, coercive, poor attitudes about learning, parents that don't support them at home in terms of their school behavior and so on. We're acting like none of those factors exist or matter. They matter. Uh, 18 hours of every day is spent outside the purview of the school. Colin Powell, is the only federal spokesperson I have heard who actually gets it right. He acknowledges the role of societal contributions to the problems that schools are having. We want schools to compensate and offset and buffer our dysfunction and neglect as a society in safely raising and socializing our children to be effective citizens. And you can quote me all day on that one. Um, thank you. PBIS uh, uses uh, discipline referrals in their systematic recording and analysis, the school effectiveness tool, and regular student progress monitoring to improve schools. 
People who want to improve schools should take a look at these procedures and techniques. I think to solidify its role and make it available more broadly, PBIS needs to be a part of the reauthorizations that are upcoming for the Elementary and Secondary Education Act and the IDEA reauthorizations. You need powerful advocates and you can get them because of your success. And those advocates would be chief state school officers, the National School Boards Association, the Association of Elementary and Secondary Principals, the AFT and the NEA. Congress needs to sit there and hear these powerful organizations sing your praises. And that will have an awful lot to do with getting PBIS in, I don't know what the word is I want, I guess, integrated into the re reauthorizations of those acts. What are some challenges facing PBIS in the next decade? I think you need to more aggressively develop a participant and advocacy role for PBIS involving families. Continue focus on, continue your focus on innovations and fine tuning and adaptations that preserve the dynamic nature of PBIS and its core elements, but adjusted to um, uh, local conditions and uh, uh, other areas of application. Recommit to a high quality PBIS implement, implementation and its careful assessment. Continue extending the reach of PBIS to diverse populations, contexts, and problems. Please don't forget the little aggressive antisocial boys that I'm so partial to. Um, I have to tell you quickly about an intervention for aggressive children that we developed in the late 70s, early 80s called RECESS. Stands for Reprogramming Environmental Contingencies for Effective Social Skills. And it was to teach little Attila the Hun boys in K through three how to be civilized in their behavior, how to be polite and cooperative and respond positively, participate and so on. And we got a referral from a school of a little boy named Richie, that's not his real name, but we sent the observer out to code his playground behavior. And we have a standard coding form, but we ask the observer to write down things the child does, you know, like hits, bites, kicks, scratches. The first day she came back with front and back of a eight and a half by 11 page full of things this boy had done. So I wanted to see what he looked like. <laughs> so I go out the next day with the observer and I'm standing on the playground. And out of, for no reason at all, he goes over and attacks a little kindergarten boy about two thirds his size has him down on the ground choking him. So the recess supervisor runs over, breaks it up, calls the principal, the counselor comes out. This entourage is leading the little boy in to call his parents. And I walked up beside him and I said, say, you mind if I ask you a question? He said, sure. I said, can you tell me why you choked that little boy like that, why you attacked him? And he looked at me like I was out to lunch and he said, well, it was recess. <laughs> uh, okay. So uh, I think a challenge is to uh, document the cultural responsiveness and relevance of PBIS and to show that sustained P PBIS improves student achievement as well as student behavior. And I wish you the best and I'm confident of your f future success. Thank you. Oh, quit on time. <laughs>